Welcome to the Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. On today's episode of the HEAL podcast, I interview Dr. Shafali. This interview with Dr. Shafali makes me so grateful I am able to do what I do. I feel so incredibly lucky to be able to sit down and speak with the brilliant minds who have directly helped transform my life for the better. Shafali is a clinical psychologist and has written three New York Times bestsellers. Her two landmark books, The Conscious Parent and The Awakened Family, are two of the most important books I've read regarding parenting and self-help, to be honest, in the past few years. A little background about Shafali. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Columbia University. Specializing in the integration of Western psychology and Eastern philosophy, she brings together the best of both worlds for her clients. She is an expert in family dynamics and personal development, teaching courses around the globe. Oprah has endorsed her work as revolutionary and life-changing, and I would have to agree. I am a personal growth junkie, so curious and driven to understand what it means to be human and learn how to break free from the prisons of our minds. But even I was not prepared for how reading A Radical Awakening would make me feel. This book is so important for women everywhere, but it is not for the faint of heart. Dr. Shafali lifts the veil on this cultural matrix we've been living in and gives us the tools to break free, turn our pain into power, and live an awakened life. Buckle up for a taste of a radical awakening. All right, so Dr. Shafali, thank you so much for coming on the show. I am, I've you know, recently I have a two-year-old daughter and have been devouring your conscious parenting books. So very excited for you to continue your teaching through this new book, A Radical Awakening, because I need that to be a better parent. Oh, thank you. Yes, we all need, uh, as women especially, a real call to our inner sovereignty and empowerment. And that's what this book, A Radical Awakening, is about. So thank you for having me. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about um, your background and what the impetus was for this latest book, for your own personal awakening? Well, I've been going through a spiritual journey for the past 25 years. And like all spiritual journeys, there are so many pivoting points of unfolding and shedding and letting go. So, you know, while I had let go of a lot of my conditioning, I was still holding on to an idea of how to be this good woman, this perfect girl, this perfect mother and wife. And I think when my daughter hit her teenage years, I was ready to shed that. And then the entire dynamics of my marriage changed and uh, it couldn't sustain the changes. So we did end up divorcing. And I went through such a huge transformation because I began to see the pressure culture puts on women to stay in long-term relationships. Never mind, I had been in this relationship for 25 years. It wasn't long enough because it wasn't until death. And uh, I began to see how many of my female clients were trapped in either this or other cultural mores and boxes that were suffocating them and not allowing them to feel like they could be their most authentic. So I wrote this book, because of my own epiphanic break free from the last cage I was in, which is the idea of being a particular kind of woman, uh, the cage is always an internal one, it's never external, and to help women break out of their internal cages. And uh, so this book is really an ode and an homage for women to answer their own awakening, to answer their own sovereignty, and to really wake up to who it is they are untethered from the expectations and pressures of culture. It is truly eye-opening and, you know, awakening. The first step is awareness. You know, our, we're just yes. running in this kind of cultural conditioning and subconscious programming. And I even talk about it in the documentary 
um, you know, I'm very aware of the conditioning that our medical uh, establishment has placed on us and the doctors and our whole system. Um, but your book opened me up, like opened my eyes very in a very dis disconcerting way uh, to all of the cultural conditioning and made me even, you know, question my own beliefs because we're mm -hmm. so attached to our own beliefs. You talk about nature. There's no, you don't say I believe in nature. Nature just is. There's laws that are, that we just accept. So if you, I was really kind of shaken off my ground when you said, you know, if you, if you have a belief, if you start a sentence with, I believe you're usually talking about a fictitious thing. I was like, wait a second. I'm questioning my beliefs now. Well, all the reason we say, I believe is that because it's optional, like, what do you believe? <laughs> right? So it's very hard for us to understand that, but true liberation in the spiritual sense of achieving this place of untethered uh, confirmation of your essence can only occur when you separate from all these belief systems. Culture has indoctrinated us to believe in things that are really misbeliefs. They're all cultural, fictitious fantasies. And it's very hard for people to get that. This book is not comfortable in that way. It's only meant for those who are willing to go beneath, through, above, uh, and look at themselves at every angle. And it's not a feel-good book. It's a do you want to grow book, right? Do you want to see what's really keeping you stuck book? So my books, none of them are entertaining, really. They're all paradigm shifting in some deep way because awakening can only occur when you understand what's been blocking you. And most of us are blocked because of a misbelief. That's it. It's so simple, really, but it's so hard because we are profoundly indoctrinated and brainwashed by our beliefs. We don't even believe that our belief is a belief. We think <laughs> our belief is a real thing, but yet you're saying, I believe, right? And, but the, the fact that you have to say, I believe, means it's not unanimous. And if it's not unanimous, means it's not a law of nature, meaning it's up for you, right? So this village in, in, in Timbuktu believes this, this village in... in um, Tanzania believes this, Tanzania, you guys say, uh, this belief in uh, this uh, village in Sri Lanka believes, believes this and so on and so forth. So as long as we know it's a belief, which means it's part of that culture's fiction, wonderful. But no, we think our beliefs are real. And that's why they're religious wars and ideological separations between people, because each one thinks that their belief is not a belief, it's real. Oh my gosh, it's it's so true, and it's so simple, but it's so profound. Um, yes. And and just the the fact that your book gives us kind of the tools for that self questioning and exploration, I'm so grateful. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about you? You said you went through this divorce process, and I know there's grieving to that. There's we look at divorce as a failure in this in this society, and and then you you know you get into the war mentality of divorce and that whole process. Can you talk about a little bit about your experience through that and, and what you became aware of to help others who may be going through that right now? Well, in order to talk about divorce, we need to talk about our ideas around love and marriage. So a lot of our love is conditional and people don't like to hear that. And I always say love without consciousness is ownership, possession and control. And this is a, we just could have an hour talk on that, you know. Totally. Love without consciousness is ownership, power, and control, possession and control. And most of our love to our children, to our loved ones is love without consciousness. So in the name of love, we perform heinous acts of possession and control. But we don't want to see that because we're like, but I love my kid, but I love my partner. But the love is not freedom. So true love is freedom. True love is full on acceptance. True love is sovereignty. And all other love is attachment. So first we need to understand we may not be loving. We may just be needy. We just may be dependent. We just may be enmeshed and addicted. So most of us don't even love. The next thing is marriage. Marriage is an institution. 
people don't like to hear that. I'm like, okay, what do we, what do you think it is? It's an institution which has two other institutions infiltrating it, the judicial system institution and the religious institution. So we have three institutions now that take the beauty of freedom, AKA love, love and freedom should be synonymous, but we take this freedom and we now prescribe it into, you know, legislation, a contract and religious morality. Now you've squeezed this emotion of love in like a rag towel. It's just laying like a dry heap on the floor, right? And uh, then we have the tradition of parenting, which as I've shown through my books, the traditional form of parenting is all based on control. So control, 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 control. So let's not call it love, let's just call it control. How are you gonna control me more? And how are you gonna make me feel so bad because I'm not wanting to be controlled and then I'll be more controlled because I'll be shamed. That's just all what we're doing really. Now this doesn't mean one person on a block A cannot have an amazing unionship and another one on block D cannot have an amazing unionship. I'm talking about the institution of marriage. I had an amazing relationship according to my level of consciousness for as long as it lasted. When my consciousness changed, the marriage couldn't hold it anymore. And so it needed to change. And that's how it should be, right? So this is not, I'm not against the union of two people. I'm against the institution. And we need to understand we are institutionalizing the freedom of free love. No problem, but just understand we're putting it in a prescription. We have a checklist, we have a contract. If somebody breaks the contract, now we feel we have a right to not love them and then enters divorce. So the only reason divorce is plagued is because the ideas around marriage are dysfunctional. If we understood marriage to be about growth, sovereignty, autonomy, and acceptance, then divorce would not be toxic. But because marriage is solely based on the longevity model, not on the growth model, divorce is toxic. Divorce is a failure, really, because you can never get out of I mean, there is no such thing as a, a, a successful marriage unless it goes till you die. And I say it should go until your ego dies, until that growth cycle dies, until that chapter dies. It, it doesn't have to be physical death. Right. So death do us part should be the ego's death, should be that cycle's death, should be that that chapter's death, not physical death. But anything short of physical death is now seen as failure because marriage is, according to me, based on a primitive paradigm of only longevity is the marker of success. It doesn't matter if you two hate each other's guts. It doesn't matter if you live on separate continents or separate bedrooms, never have sex. Doesn't matter if you're a brother and sister really. Doesn't matter if you're just good friends. If you're not staying in the contract for the world to see, that is success. Now within that narrow definition of success, of course, divorce is the enemy, right? So I like to rename divorce as a rebirth, as a reemergence, as the end of a chapter, as a restructuring. I mean, call it whatever you want. I don't mind the word divorce. It's just as the word has been so blasphemized. I use it freely, but people go like, shh. I go, why, why, why? They're like, don't use the divorce word. Use the D word or just don't say it. I go, why? Right? It's because there's so much shame around it. It's insanity. You know, it's the most healthy thing to get out of the contract if the contract isn't working. You do it with your car, you do it with your schools, you do it with your job, but you can't do it with this. You know, you live longer with this person. I live longer with this person than my parents. But do I hate my parents? No. So why does this have to be a negative thing? So I'm now just not, not against marriage. I'm just against the idea that anything but the longevity model is success. Amazing. Um, yeah, he said divorce was not a failure, but a divorce from her inauthentic self and past. So you're divorcing this inauthenticity. And I love how this book really kind of opens, well, it opened my eyes and gave me, you know, a path forward to living in my authenticity. Because obviously intellectually, I want to do that. But just the other day, you know, I've been on a personal growth path for many years. And as you describe these personas in the book, I'm like, oh my gosh, it just became so clear to me 
where I get stuck in these personas and why, you know, I suffer or why I'm so exhausted or stressed out, you know, um, even to the point where, you know, one day I was in my, like a couple of days ago, I was just feeling this. I didn't know. I couldn't even name the emotion I was feeling. And I'm like, what am I feeling? How do I not, how am I not connected to my feelings? And then I was reading the personas. I was like, oh, that's why. So what, it's so what, helpful. Which, which one was it? Um, that one was uh, probably the shield uh, wow. persona, you know, but trying, I, to I, with, trying to be superhuman and superwoman. And- yeah. And being raised by, again, my poor father, I bring him up in almost every episode, but mm-hmm. being raised by someone who was so explosive that I just wanted to put a lid on all my emotions. I was like, I, I was mortified by certain behaviors uh in the public and so i i just like suppressed all my emotions and we're just so detached from our feelings wow. um yep that's the shield so you see that our childhood experiences shape us to help us to cope the shield helped you cope it said to you it said to yourself you know allowed you to say to yourself okay that's dysfunctional that's toxic i'll just be this and this way i'll be safe so we create these personas to help us, but then they also mess us up in our adult life to, because they don't allow us to access our true self. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. Um, so in that same vein, you know, we talk about, we've heard this many different times. It's like, you know, someone's opinion about, about you is none of your business. And it's all about the projection of someone else's pain and, their lens of life onto you. And it really has nothing to do with you. It's impersonal um, and more has to do with their conditioning and their perception. Mm-hmm. So how, how have you, or what are some tools or how do we really release that need for outside validation and an attachment to that, you know, the likes or the dislikes negative or positive, you know, commentary. Yeah. Just like we began to attach to it, in the first place, it took time. In the same way to detach is going to take time. It's going to take the evolution of your companionship with yourself. That's what has been missing for us girls, especially for us women, is as girls, we were so disconnected to our own knowing, to our own wisdom, because we were told make others happy, you know, put others first. That's a good girl. That's what good girls do that we shoved our own connection to ourselves really to the bottom of the pole. So now, just like we took many years to shove it down, it's going to take many years for it to come back up. But that is the plant we have to water. And in order to water that plant, we have to stop watering the outside plant. So, you know, we have to start detaching and start watering this one. And it it happens synergistically almost, where you turn your attention to what am I feeling? What am I not speaking the truth to? How am I not owning my own feelings? Wait, 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 wait. What am I feeling? So we keep watering that plant, even though it's been so neglected. We don't even know. Like you said, what am I feeling? Right? That's why I gave terms to it, just to help women to understand their patterns. Because we don't even understand how to notice the pattern. Right? You look, but you don't know where to look. So as you begin to have words, so this book gives words to the narrative, words to the feelings that we never knew we could have or our patterns. Now you begin going, oh my God, that's that. Oh, this is this. Now I'm divorcing myself. Now I'm scared. Now I'm in fear of rejection. Now I'm in fear of abandonment. Just by placing the fear, you begin to notice yourself. You begin to become aware. You turn your attention inward. Each time you turn your attention inward, what you're doing is not turning it outward, right? So you stopped watering that plant. You started watering this plant. And bud by bud, drop by drop, this inner blossom begins to expand. And now you have a new inner terrain that is flourishing, which you never had before. And, you know, it seems cliched, but there is this inner abundance that grows within you that consumes you to the point where you're not hungry for another's Bounty. You have so much bounty inside you. You're not foraging for others. And it is profound and it is liberating. And that's what this book, A Radical Awakening, promises is, well, not a full promise. You know what I mean? It's the glimmer of the aspiration of each woman blossoming her own inner terrain to such abundance that her need for the other goes away. 
So it's 380 pages and it was 520 pages of intense inner growth that I take women on step by step so that they can develop this. It's not just a motivational book that they should. It tells you how you can. So helpful because I, again, I've been on this journey for so long and it was very helpful to have it written because I'm so visual in one place that I, you know, I was underlining the book like crazy and, yeah. and I started reading it on vacation last week and I, it was very hard to dive in. And I'm sure that was my ego going, oh God, change is coming, change is coming. Right. But then when I focused yesterday and just like, just devoured the pages, I was like, you know, it is so hopeful and it is so empowering and it is, it just knocks, it like shine, like turns on the light of awareness. Um, you see through the matrix, you deconstruct the patriarchy, um, how women and men are, are designed biologically, which, which dictates this whole sexual conditioning that we go through. Um, so talk a little bit about that because, I'm actually working with a sex therapist right now because I interviewed her on this podcast and she said, um, you know, sexual freedom or healing, sexual healing is the final frontier of spiritual awakening. And I know like how, how do we, you know, how did you reclaim your sexual power? Again, it is only through unlayering all the bullshit we've been told around sexuality that comes from patriarchy that I could begin to touch upon my own inner power and therefore my sexuality. And as I touched on my sexuality, I touched on my inner power. It is all the things that we've been told are wrong with us that we need to untalk ourselves out of. You know, even the fact that we women are not even comfortable in our bodies, that has a direct impact on our capacity to be sexual in our bodies, right? So many women don't know where their clitoris is. They don't accept their bodies in broad daylight. They want to hide. They never show themselves to their partners. All these things are indoctrinations from culture because culture was so clever. It told women that that's not what a good girl does. And because we so want to be a good girl, we gave up that power. But when we gave up our sexuality, we gave up our own self-celebration and our own power to make ourselves happy and joyful and own our own bodies. And the more disconnected we are from our bodies, the more in control we are by the patriarchy, the more we compete with other women because we're all trying to look according to a standard instead of owning our bodies. So the ripple effect is drastic, it's dysfunctional and profound. So again, it all comes back to unlayering from what culture has told us, separating from the cultural topic and uh, narrative around sexuality. And this book reminds us that there's another narrative and there are many narratives really, but it's definitely not this one na narrative. And people are not liking that part in the book and they think <laughs> I'm promoting a leftist agenda of sexual anarchy. So this is what we need to realize that culture will push back, culture will resist because culture is all about control. So anything that reeks even, or even like hints aromatically of, of freedom, culture is going to clamp down on it because we've been so subjugated to not be free. It's so sad to me. Like when I tell women, you know, masturbation is their right and they can enjoy it. They go, no, how can you talk like this? You know, like as if my vagina is only for the man. And I go, there you go. You're just giving your power. I'm telling you to take your power back. You don't want it. Right. So one woman wrote aptly slow, aptly so she said, I don't know whether I'm ready for so much freedom. And isn't that tragic that mm -hmm. so much freedom, right? We're not ready. We don't know if we're ready for so much freedom. We've been made so afraid of freedom because we've been so comfortable being controlled that we, we're even apprehensive of touching liberation. I mean, that's really sad, right? That's like the bird in the cage. You open the door and the bird doesn't fly. Mm hmm. Exactly. Or the elephant that was tied up as a kid elephant, and then they get yeah. big and strong and it could easily have ripped that rope and they don't even have to attach the rope to anything. It just stays there because it's been conditioned to believe it can't go anywhere. Yes. Yes. And uh, it's just so once you turn on the light, you can't go back and, and your book presents it in a way that you if you do get triggered, it's like this is exactly the areas that you need to look at. Right. We're like fish in the ocean we're not aware that we're drinking, breathing water. You know, that's how deeply ingrained we are in this conditioning. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, in your conscious parenting books, it's, you talk about, it's not about what your child is doing or not doing. It's about how you're reacting it. And it's, and it's, and it's turning inward and, and parenting yourself, healing those parts of yourself so that we can break this conditioning and not pass this down generationally. So that was my train of thought from before. Absolutely. There, there are no five evil men on the top. However, there is a patriarchy uh, and this, it's indisputably toxic. And again, there's, the men suffer too. The men suffer from it as well. No one is benefiting from anything that is toxic. But we need to recognize that currently the system more favors, of course, the male and if the white male, but that doesn't matter. It's a system that is fully perpetuated and controlled now by everyone who participates. So it's everybody's responsibility, especially those who are oppressed, really, in this case, the woman, to, to rise up. Because the, the ones in comfort on the throne will not give up the throne. So let's not even look to them to give us permission or to change. And this is for every micro life or every macro life, right? I always tell women who are, say, in a, in a relationship where they feel controlled, I, I always tell them, don't wait for the controller to give up the control. They're, they're enjoying the control. You have to rise into your power to check the control. So that's what this book does. It doesn't lay blame. I've been very compassionate about all men. But it calls it what it is. If it currently is a toxic patriarchy, it's just what it is. But all men suffer from it too. Some are more privileged than others, but even the privileged are cut off from their heart because toxic patriarchy means it's toxically masculine, which means the masculine beauty, beauty that masculinity can be is now at a toxic level. But the femininity can be at a toxic level too. In my life, there were moments where I was toxically feminine. And I needed to enter the beauty of my femininity without becoming toxically feminine. In the same way, masculinity, which is beautiful, is currently toxically masculine. So aggressive, what could be assertive and beautifully aggressive, as in protective, is now toxically invasive and violent, right? What, 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 can, be, what can be territorial in terms of being uh, protective of the tribe is now gotten territorial to the point of invading and dominating others. So what could be beautiful about masculinity, strong boundaries, assertive boundaries, clear boundaries, is now worldwide dominion, right? It's like domination. That's not boundaries, that's domination. So that's what I mean by the toxic patriarchy, where healthy components of masculinity have become toxic. Yes. And it's all about, you know, even like you say, the men are suffering. So it's their wounded children, too, that are just... Yes not whole, searching outside of themselves for validation, power, submission, all of that. Um, and so I love this parallel just between love and what it truly is. And we can't enter a relationship with and feel true love if we're not whole ourselves. We can't be a, a good conscious parent unless we're whole ourselves. So it's really yes. deconstructing all of this conditioning and coming back to, you know, parenting ourselves or, or, or growing up into adults and letting go of all these protection mechanisms of, of a ch as that we developed as children for survival. Yes. I mean, all of these wars against each other and invasions and this desire for greed and profit that this world is currently based on comes from unhealed childhood trauma. Like, why do you need to like devour people and dominate territories and go to the moon it comes from a childish fantasy of omnipotence because you feel so helpless. You know, you know, narcissism is a defense against utter helplessness. So we're just, you know, reacting from our three-year-old selves and ruling the world and driving it crazy because we are disconnected. Like you said, we're not whole from within. Yeah. So radical awakening will help us heal ourselves so that, you know, when enough people can awaken, we can create a different paradigm. Yeah. Um, you say to love someone is to feel for them without our own feelings about ourselves getting in the way. That so is hard. like <laughs> so hard. How do we, you know, talk about true love for a minute? Yeah, it's really hard. It's an aspiration. It, it, at least to understand what that is, right? So then we can aspire to it. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Because I think everyone uses the word love so glibly. Everyone thinks they've arrived there just because they feel it. They they have uh, transcendent love is an arrive. You have to get there. You have to cultivate it. It's it's, easy. Other love is full of ego, you know. So to truly transcend to that place of equanimous, unconditional acceptance is not to pollute your own self in that equation. So if your partner says something that goes against your belief systems doesn't mean you now shut down from them, but you understand them, you accept them, you see them on their own path, on their own destiny, just like with our children, and you set them free if that's how and where they need to go. You don't feel betrayed if they need to leave you. If you really love them, how are you feeling betrayed? It's because you expected something from them and they're quote unquote breaking the contract, but true love has no contract. The only contract true love is based on is freedom, Mm. which comes from acceptance, release, surrender, grace, wholeness. When you're whole, you don't bind someone to you from a contract. (laughs) That's exactly right. That's 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 the most beautiful friendship in the world, right? So that's what we need to have with everyone. Yeah. So to become whole, we first need to love ourselves and fully accept ourselves and where we are in our journey and then not seek for someone else to fill Mm -hmm. our holes. Um, Mm -hmm. So you also talk about um, in the parent, in the motherhood part of the book, which I thought was so applicable to me right now as I'm trying to do everything right and Mm -hmm. not mess up my child or not pass down my (laughs) generational uh, stuff. Um, you, you say in the book, we have turned happiness into a goal when really it's only a, an emotion and a fleeting one at that. It's mm-hmm. so true. We work so hard to have this ideal life where we think we'll be happy, but happiness is an emotion that's fleeting. So can you talk a little bit about that and how to pivot from seeking happiness to seeking presence? Yeah. I mean, it's stripped so many of us parents up and individuals up this idea of being happy you know what is happiness you know it never lasts it's it's momentary just like all other fleeting emotions so when we understand that we have again ossified this fleeting emotion into stone just like we've ossified love which is a a free emotion into stone um this is what we people do you know we we want everything in a box it's dualistic Uh, uh do you love me or do you not are you happy or are you not You know, life is not like that. Life is flowing. Life is all sorts of things all at once. But because we cannot tolerate the uh, ambiguity of the impermanence of the complexities, we want it in a box. So we've decided happiness is a goal, which is so insane, because it robs us from experiencing life that doesn't feel happy. So anything that doesn't look happy, we are canceling it. We're like, nope, 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 nope. So we are avoiding anything that doesn't look happy, which is almost 98% of life, right? Because life just is. For a lot of life, it just is ordinary. It's just, and we don't want that because we want happiness, meaning ecstatic. You know, we want to be on some drug high all the time. And then when we're not, we look for the high, right? This is, this is the problem. Then we're on the chase for happiness. And instead... Just be in the isness of whatever you're experiencing, like really come down from the intellect of what it should be like, the the as if to the as is, Mm -hmm. and really surrender to that. You know, I teach people all the time that, you know, they're unique, but they're not special. They don't like that. They're like, no, we are special. I'm like, no, you're really not. And there's a reason I say that. Because we think we deserve a happy life. Maybe Kelly doesn't. Maybe Samantha doesn't, and Dave and Brian certainly don't. But I deserve a, why Why do you deserve a happy life? Because somewhere we have this princess fantasy that we're something special. And I tell everyone, you're really unique. Get off the high horse that you're special. You will be betrayed. You will be hurt. You will die. You know, and your poop will stink. Well, what do you want? You know, once you accept that about yourself that you are okay with the okayness, with the ordinariness, then you will probably be way more happy. But if you're chasing this goal, this fantasy of ecstasy, because you think you're like deserving and entitled to some different life from everyone else, then you're going to be really unhappy. (laughs) You know, we set ourselves up for some bullshit, you know, of like, 
because we have some narcissism around we deserve a happy life. No, you don't. You just deserve a life. And can you just live your life and, and be in your life and be awake to your life? Whatever it is, it is, you know? And that's why we're all chasing this idea of beauty and this idea of youth and this idea of success, which is very linear and narrow because we all want to be that special. And nobody is special, you know? Ask any most famous person who's landed on 10 moons if they, if they got to happiness and they'll be like, oh no, I didn't find it on the 10th moon either. I went <laughs> looking for the 10th moon. There is no such thing because at the end of the day, it just is the present moment. So I speak about replacing happiness, the idea, the delusion of it with presence. Are you present? Are you here? Are you fully awake? Are you you? That's the 10th moon. <laughs> exactly. So do you, I'm so curious to know, you're, you know, you're so conscious and present and you've gone through this awakening, like who have been your teachers? Like, where have you, is this just a knowing through your work that you've discovered along the way? What are your spiritual beliefs or who are, who are some of your teachers that kind of taught you yeah, what you I know? I think the greatest teachings were the teachings of the Buddha and I'm not Buddhist. And I don't even know whether he existed, but this person that they call the Buddha. And I love the teachings because uh, the teachings are all about going inward. And the Buddha is attributed to have taught this technique called Vipassana, which is insight meditation, which is just the breath and the body sensations. You begin to observe. And you begin to observe how your mind doesn't want you to observe anything because the mind is chattering. So just observing the mind-body interaction is the point of Vipassana. There's no chanting, there's no God, there's no idol, there's no prayer, there's no blessing, there's nothing. It's brutal. It's just you sit and you observe and you die, right? You die. Like I remember my first Vipassana meditation retreat. I mean, I must have checked my watch like I swear to you every 30 seconds. And I was like, what is this 30 seconds? It's brutal torture because you've never sat and observed and you don't do anything except observe. Can you imagine that torture? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but it was the most genius. So that teaching to me has been my everything. Like that was, I got, I got it. I understood that we put from our mind all sorts of, in positions that are not there. I began to see how by observing the body on its own, that that was my true nature. And then how my mind was putting total garbage onto it and judging, 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 whether it was positive judging, like, oh, I'm happy or negative. Oh, I hate this. Oh, I'm happy. Oh, I hate this. I was doing this constantly. Like, Actually, I was only doing negative. Like, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I only judge. And then when I left that retreat, all things became clear. I began to understand the workings of my mind. I began to see myself imp imposing all the time. There was nothing that I kept as is. I always had an as if that I put on it. And that's what we humans do. And until we understand this, we will not be liberated because our own minds are driving us crazy and we don't even know it. So this technique of meditation to me is the pathway. What, you have to sit to observe and be, and be tortured by your own mind because your mind cannot be still. Your mind cannot observe. We are not observing anything. We're only reacting. And we're reacting from our complete brainwashed conditioning. And no one wants to hear this because they want to believe that their beliefs are not beliefs. As I said, they want to believe that they know. They don't know. The only thing we know is we don't know, but we act like we know, but we're only believing. So until we get this whole paradigm shift. So I've been doing this since 21 and I'm barely succeeding. But this is what I this is how I find my quote unquote wisdom is not because of me is because of these teachings by this whoever this person was, who, if maybe it was many people the generations called the Buddha. I don't know, but these teachings have been gold and there's no belief to it. It's just brutal observation. And that's what appeals to me that there's no belief to it. Mm. It's just observe you and see the schism between what is and what you put on it. Profound. A, yeah. Then you begin to see you're always in your movie. You're like, wow, I'm never out of my movie. And then you could observe that because you're yes. practicing observance. So now yes. you can be the awareness 
watching your thoughts and and then you're not you're it. not you're not caught up in it right to watch yourself in the movie means to be out of the movie already then you watch yourself watching yourself in the movie now you're even more out of the movie so now that's what i call leaving the matrix right awakening from the matrix now you see the movie as the matrix or the matrix as the movie and you don't need to be part of it anymore now you have choice in that choice is freedom ah oh, so good um Last, last question. Um, I think this is, you know, can you talk a little bit about the difference between victim consciousness and victimhood? I think that's profound because again, subtle, but is everything. Yeah, I think victim consciousness and victimhood is the same, but it's different from victim. So many of us are victims. You know, people who've been physically abused are pure victims of that physical domination. If you're raped, you're a victim of rape. If you have somebody who's been racist toward you, you're a victim of racism. And I think many of us women have been trained not to say we're victims because that means we're, you know, causing trouble or we don't, but the word victim has been so blasphemized. So I want women to understand there's pride and there's no shame in saying you've been a victim. Like, how is it your fault? I was a victim of childhood molestation. I knew right from the start, it wasn't my fault. However, I was scared to tell my parents because I knew they would be devastated. But I never took it inside me. I knew these men are effed up because I'm like, something's wrong with these people. I, I knew that for some strange reason that it wasn't because of me. So I've never felt ashamed of being a victim of molestation. I say it all the time. But people have an issue with me saying it. They're like, oh my goodness, right? I'm like, no, it wasn't my fault. I'm proud. I'm like, okay, it was part of my story. Now, many of us have been victims. I mean, Entire generations have been victims of slavery. Generations have been victims of the Holocaust, victims of, and we women have been victims in many ways. Now, having said that, how do we separate that and own that and own the PTSD that comes from that? Not bypass it, heal it so that we don't stay stuck in victim consciousness. Victim consciousness occurs when you're the poor me, the poor me, and everyone's fault and everyone's doing this to me because we haven't healed the initial root of the victim. So we have to take the person back into their childhood and help them heal that so that they can then get out of victim consciousness. Victim consciousness means we're staying stuck, blaming the other, and then actually giving our power away. So yes, shitty things happened, horrible things happened. But now how do we heal from that so that we don't do it to ourselves anymore? By giving our power away through blame, we actually victimize ourselves over and over. Now, there's a difference between blame and asking people to take responsibility. So when we say you're to blame, you're to blame, you're to blame, that is that strident, angry, feminist cry that sometimes is counterproductive. The healthy feminist battle warrior is the one who says, take responsibility. One is to say, you're fucked up, I hate you, you're to blame. That's the angry feminist cry, which is not healthy. And the healthy feminist battle warrior, spiritual warrior is the one who says, hey, I'm checking you, I'm calling you to take responsibility by my speaking up. I'm going to speak up, speak my truth, take responsibility. You see, there's different energy in that. So good. Well, I just think that your this book is such a, you know, it's it's a clarion call for those feminists to take their power back in a healthy way by healing rather than projecting. And as more of us reclaim our true feminine power and realize the matrix that we've been in and, and start to heal and deconstruct this conditioning, uh, the more we can bring that feminine power into a new paradigm so that there's more balance between male and female, yes. masculine and feminine. Yes, that's the goal. That's the intention. So thank you so much. Where can people find you? And please go get this book. It's, it's, it's so powerful. So they can buy the book at aradicalawakening.com. And uh, there are indie bookstores there so they can support them. And then I'm on Facebook and Instagram too. And my website is drshafali.com. Amazing. Well, thank you for any 
any mothers out there, any anyone, male, female, um, again, check out this book. It it will open your eyes, and you could uh, just never go back to being in the matrix. It's it's such a gift. Thank you so much, Dr. Shivali. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gorris. Thank you so much and be well.